Well, good morning, Westside. And obviously it wasn't quite what I was expecting for this morning, but this is uh, the Kinnicker family playing it safe. We um, went and had vacation and we're with family and Omicron is, I guess, fairly virulent, as you all know. And so um, people ended up testing positive. Our family got sick. Uh, we'd been immunized. And so uh, we're doing the thing I was, I was even, though I've had it once, I was symptomatic for a couple of days. So five day quarantine after the end of symptoms uh, puts me back in the office on Tuesday. Uh, but I was still able to work from home, able to prepare this message, and um, we are jumping back into Romans. The name of the sermon for today is Tension, and we are going to be in Romans chapter 7. Will you pray with me? Loving Father, I thank you that uh, you are for us, you are with us, and, um, and you give us both energy and hope. And in the midst of all that we are going through, even with this pandemic, we pray your blessings, Lord, that we might choose life and follow you. Bless us this morning as we uh, re-engage with the best news ever. And uh, pray your Holy Spirit to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, have you ever been disappointed in God? If you've, if you've experienced disappointment, it is disappointment with God. It is something like a swirling cauldron of dark emotions, despair, frustration, anger, fear. Now, one of the things that happens is, is that you, know, you come into the church, you start to get religious, and you, you can even begin to wonder, can we even talk about disappointment with God? But as you grow, as you begin to engage with the scriptures, you realize that actually, especially in the Psalter, disappointment with God is, is common. In fact, this is the life of faith. It is marked by this tension where we hear God's good promises and yet at the same time we experience life and it is hard to hold this together. How do we make sense of what we say we believe about God? All-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful, perfect, sovereign. How do we make sense of all of that in our experience of the world? Broken, bleak, heart-rending. In 1,000 Gifts, Anne Voskamp writes about this tension of faith. She writes about it going through real suffering, real hardship. She shares her story, but it is a story where in the midst of the darkness, there is this journey towards the light, towards hope, even towards joy. 1,000 Gifts by Anne Voskamp. It is raw, it is real. Her life very early on as just a young girl was scarred. Her two-year-old sister was killed by a delivery truck on the gravel driveway right in front of the whole family. And that loss, that death, it shaped their whole life growing up. She writes, when you bury a child or when you simply get up every day and live life raw, you murmur the question soundlessly. No one hears. Can there be a good God? A God who graces us with good gifts when a crib lies empty through long nights and bugs burrow through coffins. Where is God, really? She goes on and she shares, My family, my dad, my mama, my brother and younger sister, for years we all silently asked, these questions. For years, we come up empty. We live our lives clenched fist. What God once gave us on a day in November, in November slash deep. Who risks again after something like that? I don't know if I can imagine something worse than the loss of a child. 
but the sources of disappointment and disappointment with God can be legion. A marriage that ended in betrayal and divorce, a career that was derailed, innocence that was vandalized. If you have any familiarity with Romans 7, you on the surface you might be wondering why are we talking about disappointment with God when we're in Romans 7? Well, it's been eight weeks since we have been in Romans, and I want to give you a little bit of a recap. And, and as we build to this place of Romans 7, I, I think it'll make some sense about talking about disappointment with God in the midst of, of what Paul teaches us in Romans 7. Paul is writing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's writing about the gospel of the Jesus Christ, which is the best news ever. He's writing to Christians in Rome, both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Now, one of the unique things about this letter is that this is the only time that Paul writes to a church that he didn't actually found. The letter is intended to be both an introduction as well as a source of blessing. He believes that this good news, and as he teaches it and expounds it and explains it, God will use it to be a source of blessing. And it is true for them and for the church through the ages. The gospel is God's saving plan through Israel for the whole world. And God is making what first came to Israel through Abraham, this promise, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. He's leading it to be the means by which the whole world is saved. There's a little bit of a divide, it looks like, in the church between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians because of some of these cultural differences. So Paul wants to bless them. He wants them to understand what he's teaching. He's hoping to go on a, to, to go to Spain and use Rome as the launching part, launching place so that he can do this. And so he writes this long extended letter. It's, it's the longest presentation of the gospel that we have. It's, it's Paul's most thorough explanation. Chapters 1 through 11 is one unit, one sustained discussion about the meaning and, and what the gospel, the good news of Jesus really is. The first four chapters deal with our sin problem and its response that through his death, Jesus justified us. He uses the courtroom scene because that's the place where you go to truth. In our day, if you want truth, you usually use the language of science and facts. In the ancient world, if you wanted truth, truth was determined in the court of law. And so Paul says that we are justified. It has been declared in the court of God's law that we are set free from sin through the death of Jesus. And the way this works is by faith, trusting in his promises. That, that, that opening section, we all have a sin problem, but God has responded and this is the good news. And then in, in chapters 5 through 8, we get into the next section, which is still about the gospel. But it's, it's moving forward into life. We, we've been saved from death so that we might be saved into life, and we're not waiting to die. And so Paul begins to talk about this new life that we have in Jesus Christ, marked by the Spirit of God that is at work within us. But it also ends up being a long discussion about correcting some of the misunderstandings, because when you hear that you've been saved by grace through faith alone, not by works, and there, there's nothing you can do to add, people start to go, well, does that mean I can do whatever I want? What about sin? And and where we ended before Advent was in Romans 6, and Paul's talking about the fact that we have a new relationship with sin. And he, and he uses the imagery of baptism, something powerful that they all would have felt and experienced because they themselves have been baptized. When you were plunged down into the water, spiritually you died with Christ on the cross. And when you rose from the dead, the Spirit of God dwelling in you brings you up and you are now a new creation, you have new life. And what this means is you have a new relationship to sin. The old is gone, the new has come. This, and he's, he's talking about this. Chapter 7 continues the argument of chapter 6. And, um, and he's going to move into, in chapter 8, holy living. But what ends up happening is, is in Paul talking about the old covenant, or talking about baptism and having died to this old life, he is well aware that, that, that some of the Christians in Rome have a Jewish background. 
And so he, he uses analogy to try to help bring this home where he talks about the law. Now, in Greek, this word for law, that gets translated as law in your translation, is nomos. And, and when in Paul's writing, it is best that when you see the word law, that your first guess is, is that it's not just any law, but it's actually referring to, and, and it's another way of saying, the Old Covenant. And, and when we talk about covenant, what we're talking about is, this is the agreement that God gave through Moses to the Israelites. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And this is how we're going to live together. If you hear my words and keep my commands, it will go well for you. And if not, ultimately, if, if, if you do not remain faithful, then the land is going to kick you out. You'll go into exile. This will be bad for you. So when, when we read in Paul and we come across this word law, we should think concretely the covenant that God gave to the Israelites through Moses. And it's expressed in the, ex in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books are called the Torah. Genesis gives us the background story. The next four books really spell out both story, but also give the content of the covenant, in particular Deuteronomy. And if you hear the word Deuteronomy, deutero is two, nominee is nomos, law, the second giving of the law, the second iteration of the covenant. Now, you may be wondering, what does this have to do about disappointment? Imagine that you built your whole life, your whole identity on something. It's your family tradition, it's your family business, You've sacrificed blood, sweat, and tears. You gave all that you've had to it. And this thing that you've invested in actually was given to you by God. The all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving. And now what you're hearing from this apostle, from Paul, seems to be sounding like what God gave you, what you really built your life on, leads to death. How would that make you feel? Disappointment might be an understatement. Betrayed, angry, hopeless. Now the, the truth is, is that this is not exactly what Paul was saying. The old covenant does not lead to death. But what Paul knew from experience was that there could be misunderstandings. Because at this point, reality, the way things are, is a little complicated. It's complicated in particular by sin. Complicated by the hardness of heart, which sin causes. Complicated because, in part for us, because we can't talk to the Apostle Paul in person or write a letter to him and ask him, what exactly were you meaning here? Let me share one more thing as we, as we dive into Romans 7. There is no consensus among Christians about understanding all that Paul is saying here. There is tension. Notice we get this word coming up. There is tension. But this is the time where it's also to realize that not all tension is bad. Tension is another way of talking about what it means to trust or to have faith. It, I don't have absolute knowledge. I don't know absolutely 100%. I, I hear, I trust, I, I've got to hold on to. Tension means growing. It means wrestling towards conviction. Tension is part of the Christian life. Power and weakness, greatness through service, loving the unlovable, praying for your enemies. I... I sent out on Saturday a video by email, and it's also posted on Facebook, and um, it will be on the website uh, as well, where I, I, I spend an hour, 60 minutes, talking about all of Romans 7, the challenges of interpretation, some of the, the, the details, and, and I invite you, you can do this you know, after this sermon, if you're interested, where you want to dig more deeply we're taking a big chunk of scripture today. We're taking all of chapter 7. I'm not going to be able to explain all of it to you, but I want to get to the heart of it.
I want to focus on this reality. Even though we may be tempted towards disappointment with God, when we look at our situation in the light of Romans 7, it won't end in disappointment, but it can end with real hope. You see, what Romans 7 explains is that you and I have a great enemy, and it is sin. But however great our enemy is, greater still is Jesus Christ, who we can trust to save us. So what I want to do is, is I'm going to read for you the central thrust of what Paul says in Romans 7. He, he's explaining in this section that we have a new relationship to sin. The old covenant is not the problem, but it did expose the problem. Now, a little word of explanation as we begin to read through what Paul has to say. I'm going to begin reading in Romans 7, verse 7. But when you hear the word sin, I don't want you to think about a particular sin that you do, some sort of an action where you break a command or something. Instead, in Romans 7, when you hear the word sin, what you should think of is a power, like a terrible slave owner, taskmaster, who has dominion over you. Paul has been sitting here and he's been talking about the fact that we've died. And because we've died, we're no longer under the old covenant, but we're now under the new covenant, which is better still because through the new covenant, it gives us a new relationship to sin. Now, Paul's aware that there's Jewish Christians who are hearing this, and this statement could be troubling for them. So this is how he begins. What shall we say? Is the law, the old covenant, sinful? Is the old covenant filled with the power of sin? That's basically the question. Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Now, let me explain what I think Paul is saying here. The Hebrew idea of knowledge is experiential. Paul's in some way saying, I really didn't understand the nature of sin apart from the old covenant with God. But now I'm in relationship with God and everything should be good, but it hasn't worked out that way. God's told me what I should do, but, I, but what Paul's going to continue with is that I don't always do it. But sin, this power, this taskmaster, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandments that come in the Old Covenant, produced in me every kind of coveting. Now, the Ten Commandments is the heart and center of the Old Covenant. And there we hear God says, do not covet. But now that I've heard the command, and now I have an idea that I'm not supposed to do it, man, I realize and Paul's telling us this story so that we identify with it. If I think about it, man, I covet all over the place. I, I mean, I coveted my brother's bike. Uh, you know, I, I wish I had my cousin's house. I can't believe how easy some people have it. I wish I had their life. And, and this is how it goes. Why, God, did I lose my job? Why did I have to experience abuse, divorce, a genetic proclivity towards alcoholism or drugs or the death of my child. Before I heard the command, I didn't have a name for what I was doing. But now I know and I realize it is everywhere. Now, this next part is a little confusing. Some people feel like Paul is telling the human story from the garden. There's illusions as far as if we think about Adam and Eve and the temptation and sin, that this story is getting played out. It gets played out in all of us. What Paul is doing here is he's describing what life is like for us under sin. Let me read it, and then I'll tell you what I think the big takeaway is. For apart from the old covenant, sin was dead. 
once I was alive apart from the Old Covenant, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, and this is the part, sin is this power at work within us. Sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. Here is what is clear. When we get told the way of life and then we refuse to do it, we are guilty of breaking the command. This is exactly what sin does. It is, that, it is the power that wants us to rebel against God. Sin is a power. It's at work within us. It wants to rebel against God. When we hear the command, instead of just wanting to do the command, there's part of us that doesn't want to do it just because we're told. So then, the old covenant itself is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. And then Paul continues because he knows that the Christians are hearing this and they you know, the Jewish Christians, their whole life was identified with this. They worked hard at this. This is who they were. And, and it, it, it's been feeling like what Paul is saying is, is that you built your life on something that, you know, that God gave you, but wasn't good for you. And so in verse 15, 13, we hear this. Did that which is good then become death to me? I mean, does God not know what he's doing in giving me this gift? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. In this section, Paul wants us to understand the power and nature of sin. Here is the hard truth. The best thing that you and I can do is accept Paul's diagnosis. You and I have a sin problem. And this problem of sin, this power at work within us, wants to blame God. It causes us to feel disappointment with God. The reason, the real reason that we feel disappointment with God is because of sin. We don't see things the way that we are, the way that they are. We, we don't feel things the way that they are. Even, and Paul's going to go on here, even our best efforts, even our very best thoughts are riddled with sin so that all of it should be suspect. God comes to us, he rescues us, he loves us, he blesses us, and then he speaks words of life to us. I mean, this is the story of, of the Exodus. This is the story of our salvation in Jesus Christ. In the, in the Old Covenant, God came and, and he rescued them out of Egypt and then he spoke words of life. But the power of sin working in us turns his blessings, even his very words, into death. We hear a command. Jesus says this, do not commit sexual morality, which means no sexual acts of any kind outside of the context of marriage between one man and one woman. What is common human response? Why is God trying to steal our pleasure? Why does God want to frustrate us? Why is he why so arbitrary? Instead of trusting in these good words, we accuse, we look for loopholes. We hear that Jesus came to rescue us from hell. And sometimes we can start grumbling. What kind of God allows for hell? Why is he so exclusionary? Why so cruel? That is the power of sin of what it does to us. We hear Jesus invite us to pray and to ask and to seek. And so Jesus, I prayed and I asked and I sought and yet my baby still died. I lost my job, I got sick and we get angry and frustrated and we cry out, why? Jesus promises us that we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. Romans 7 is giving us the hard truth about our condition. 
you and I cannot beat sin. Even when we were told how to live, when God spoke the very words of life, remember that the Ten Commandments, nowhere do they get described in the Bible as commandments, the Ten Commandments. And they're the Ten Words, Ten Words of Life. Now they're imperative, this is what God commands us to do, and he did command, but, the, but they're words of life. Even this hard truth is part of the good news. On the far side of the bad news is the good news. The bad news is the diagnos diagnosis, you have a sin problem. Now, we have the, this sin problem, but in Romans 7, Paul takes us deeper. The bad news is even worse than we imagined. Sin doesn't just cause us to rebel. But in Romans 7, verses 14 through 25, there is a verbal shift. He's been talking kind of as kind of giving a story of the nature of sin and its impact on us. Paul moves from the past tense to the present tense. Now, if you want to watch the video, I'll, I'll go into detail about what this means and how to understand it. But what's going on here is that Paul is trying to show us how great our sin problem is. It isn't the way things are supposed to be, especially for Christians who have the Holy Spirit. But this is the nature of our enemy. So here's what Paul says. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me, for I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. I remember the first time I read this. I was a seeker. I wasn't yet a Christian. I was reading through the New Testament. And when I read these words, it was, it was like a jolt of electricity. Uh, the Word of God is living and active. This isn't just a book written 2,000 years ago. I feel God speaking to me. And what Paul is talking about here is, is that sin is an addictive power. It, it, it ends up having mastery over us. Even when we know the good, we won't always do the good, even though we know it's the good to do. Paul sums up our situation in verse 24. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Now, there's the bad news, but on the far side of the bad news is the good news. However great the enemy, Jesus is greater still. Who will rescue me from the body that is subject to death? Jesus Christ. We are going to be tempted by sin, this sin at work within us, to blame, rebel, be confused, frustrated, and even disappointment, disappointed. Why, O oh Lord, is the cry of the broken world? Now, in the Old Covenant, we had the book of Job to help us wrestle with God. But in a fair reading of Job, the problem, what we come to is the problem is bigger than we can understand, so it's just best not to ask. It might be a little bit helpful, but not very comforting. But with Jesus, we are no longer under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. We're given more light. So listen to what Paul says in Romans 7. This is the thrust of his, a part of what he's making the point here. Sin has a hold of you, but you are not sin. There is part of you that wants to do good. That's the true you that God created you to be. Sin won't let you right now. And Jesus has come to rescue you from the power of sin. Now, how is sin overcome? It's overcome 
by holding together things that seem impossible to hold together. This is tension. The expanse of an infinite God is fit within the narrow confines of a human being. We just celebrated the story of the incarnation, God becoming human. He is a God strong enough to voluntarily become weak and plunge himself into vulnerability and suffering. Life itself dies. The greatest glory is the willingness to lay aside all glory out of love for us. Albert Camus, the atheist philosopher who struggled with the absurdity of life, wrote, Only the sacrifice of an innocent God could justify the endless and universal torture of innocence. Only the most abject suffering by God could assuage man's agony. He looked at the absurdity of life and he said, It makes no sense. It's evil. It's wrong. This is only this. Albert Camus was basically telling you the Christian story. This is, in fact, what God did. But, but why couldn't he see it? The tension. No other religion conceives of such a thing. John Dixon is a Christian professor and writer. He was speaking about the wounded God who suffers and dies for us on a university campus. During the question and answer time, a Muslim man rose up and said, how preposterous the claim that the creator of the universe should be subject to forces of his own creation. How preposterous that he would eat and sleep and go to the toilet, let alone die on a cross. This Muslim man went on to argue cogently, it's illogical for the cause of all causes that he should be able to have pain inflicted on him by lesser beings. Dixon Listen to the man explain. And he could hear that the man understood what the gospel was saying, but he just refused to accept it. Dixon's response was this. Was the, what the Muslim denounces as blasphemy, the Christian holds precious. God has wounds. It isn't easy. God allows evil to have its way for a time, and the evil is evil. It makes no sense. It is random. It is unfair. It's absurd. It rips the soul. It shatters the heart. You and I cannot fully make sense of evil because it is irrational. But it's kind of like the fact that I don't understand why I, I, I sometimes I know the good to do instead of doing the good that I know to do. I do that which I know is bad. G.K. Chesterton, explaining the tension of faith and life with God in his book Orthodoxy, wrote, Christianity got over the difficulty of combining furious opposites by keeping them both and keeping them both furious. This is faith. There's tension. This is the good news, but there's bad news. How do we hold it all together? If there is a tension at times in your walk with God, your idea of religious piety may be getting in, a way, in the way of the actual relationship. What Chesterton understands is that this tension is all about how Jesus loves, loves us. We are sometimes foolish, we are sometimes evil, we are sometimes spiteful, mean, and rude. But never, ever let this hard truth persuade you that Jesus doesn't love you and think that you're worthy to die for. In sharing her journey of disappointment and struggle, Anne von Kamp never said it was easy. But she did see what the primary issue was. Will we trust God's character, she wrote? Is he really loving? Is he really just? In response to why, to her why of the loss of her sister and all of the loss since, she experienced what she called an empty fullness. How did she get to this place where even with the emptiness, she could experience fullness?
because God gave us Jesus. She writes, if God didn't withhold from us his very own son, will God withhold anything we need? If trust must be earned, hasn't God unequivocally earned our trust with the bark on the raw wounds, the thorns pressed into the brow, your name on the cracked lips? How will he not also graciously give us all things that he deems best and right? He has already given us the incomprehensible. In the words of Chesterton, in love, he holds together the furious opposites. In Paul's letters, we find this. We, we get told first the facts about what Jesus has done, and then it usually leads to uh, then a section where he talks about, okay, in response to this, how should we live? Today has been strong on telling you what Jesus has done in light of our sin problem. But what I want to encourage you to is something very practical. I want you to put on Romans 7 glasses and I want you to see the people around you as those assaulted by sin. Romans 7 glasses help us see people not as sin, but as people with a sin problem. People who make bad choices, but who are hobbled by this terrible power. Romans 7 helps us I'm not superior. I've just been saved. I have a new relationship to sin. And through the gospel, Romans 7 moves me and you to show love and compassion, even for those who offend us the most. I want to charge you, encourage you, to put on Romans 7 glasses with somebody in your life who you find offensive, who is you're frustrated with. Now, typically, you know, it's a good idea maybe to start with something easy and move your way up. But in this, I, th I was thinking of the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies. Don't just love those who love you. Even tax collectors do this. What reward is there in that? So I want you to pick the person in your life who you find most offensive most angry, most disappointing, who, who creates the most pain or anguish for you. And I want you to start praying for that person. In, in this, I think the model of ACTS is very helpful. A, ACTS, stands for adoration. Lord, I know you love this person. You died for this person. Help me to love this person. Lord, you are loving and good, and I love you, and thank you for the love that you have for me. And then, out of the adoration, where you adore God and you affirm God's love for us and this person, confess, I don't like this person. I don't like praying for this person. Whatever you're feeling that's real at the time about you and what the call is and get in the way, you, you confess it. And then this is where it gets a little more challenging. Then, after confession, give thanksgiving. Lord, and, and when you give thanksgiving, it's not just, well, Lord, I'm thankful that I'm not in the room with this person. I want you to dig deep and I want you to say things that you are particularly thankful for about this person. Give thanks for the good that is present in the person. It, it might take some work to go and look for it. But this is the beginning of the process of seeing them the way that Jesus sees them. And then S stands for supplication. You're going to pray for them, their sin problem, their challenges. You're going to pray for blessings. Most of all, you're going to pray for their salvation. The world is dark, and Jesus calls us to shine his light into the darkness of sin and death. The world needs the church to shine the light of his grace and mercy. Right now, I mean, I feel it. The world is just training us to hate one another. But you and I have been given incredible power. But this power is love. When we let his love flow, th flow through us, it can change the world. And his strategy is more typically one person at a time. Dale Galloway tells the story of a young boy named Teddy Stoddard. He wasn't the kind of kid that 
got invited to many of his of his fellow classmates birthday parties um, he didn't wear the right clothes he was kind of smelly in fifth grade he was in mrs thompson's class and truth be told she didn't really like him in fact he you know he didn't really engage at the class he, he didn't have, he wasn't listening when she was called upon. And so she actually admits that there was a little bit of a perverse delight that she would mark his test answers wrong and even with a little larger F, right F, when he failed on his tests. And then just before Christmas holiday, students brought in gifts and she opened them. And all of the gifts, you know, were, were nicely wrapped except one was in a brown paper bag and of course it was Teddy's and when she got to that gift she opened it and inside was a, a, a rhinestone bracelet with most of the rhinestones missing and then a, a mostly empty bottle of perfume the kids laughed and at this moment Miss Thompson caught herself from being cruel and she said, look, isn't this beautiful? And she put on the bracelet and she, and she donned some of the perfume. At the end of the day, little Teddy came up to her and he said, after everybody had left, I'm glad you liked my gifts, Miss Thompson. All day long you spelled my like my mother, and her bracelet looked nice on you. After he left, Miss Thompson just sank down in tears and she sobbed. She should have known it wasn't hard. It was all in his record. First grade, Teddy is a good boy, shows promise, but has a poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy is quiet and withdrawn. His mother is terminally ill. Third grade, Teddy is falling behind. His mother died last year and his father is uninvolved. Fourth grade, Teddy is hopelessly backward. His father moved away. He lives with his aunt and is deeply troubled. Miss Thompson asked God to forgive her. She asked God to help her see what he sees when she looks at a motherless boy. And she became a new teacher. She started tutoring all the kids who needed extra help, but Teddy most of all. By the end of the year, he caught up to the rest of the class and even was ahead of some. She didn't hear from him for a number of years until one day she got a note. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know I'm graduating from high school and I'm second in my class. Love, Teddy Stoddard. Four years later, Another note, dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know I'm graduating first in my class. The university's not been easy, but I liked it. Love, Teddy Stoddard. And then four years later, another note, dear Miss Thompson, I want you to be the first to know that as of today, I am Theodore J. Stoddard, MD. How about that? I want you to come and sit where my mother would have sat because you're the nearest thing to family that I've had. Love, Teddy Stoddard. The world needs us to see them through the eyes of Romans 7. Needs us to see them not as the problem, but those with a huge, great enemy sin that is tearing them down and ripping them apart. And you and I now stand in this new place and we of all people should know. Will you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your love and your goodness and your kindness and thank you for this hard diagnosis. We don't understand it all and we don't have all the answers to all the questions, but we do have you and your love and your commitment and the way that you hold together your grace and your mercy. Help us to have this way of seeing and knowing and understanding. And may your church shine your light into all of the darkness.
especially for those who are trapped underneath this terrible taskmaster of sin. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.